Everybody. Welcome to Guided Listening this week. I'm Jeff Antoniak here from Jazzwire, and uh, we're going to listen to some Jimmy Smith and Wes Montgomery. My goodness, I'm, I'm sure that's what you're thinking. That's what you should be thinking. The album's called, uh, is it the Dynamic Duo? Is that what it's called? Yeah, it is. That's what it's called. And uh, we're going to be listening to uh, Wes's tune, Road Song. And this is actually a tune we're working on inside Jazzwire in the green community, the more novice folks, a little earlier on in their jazz journey. This is a song we're going to be doing this summer at the workshop that we have here in the Washington, D.C. area, Jazzwire Summer Summit, which is coming up uh, in July. We have people coming from across Europe, people coming from Australia, people coming from New Zealand, all across North America. So people travel around the world to uh, be with us, which is incredible. And we're working on this song together inside Jazzwire. So if you want to check out Jazzwire, if you've heard me talking about it for years now, and finally maybe uh, want to take a peek behind the paywall, easy, 30-day free trial. So uh, check out the lesson on this great song. And uh, before I forget, coming up uh, soon on May 31st, Friday, May 31st, I'm going to be in Minneapolis for some gigs. And May 31st is a great day. Uh, I'm going to be at Schmidt Music in Bloomington, just outside the city, um, doing a workshop. And gosh, is it uh, 3.30 to 4.30 or 4 to 5? You can go to Schmidt Music and find out. Send me a message. I'll let you know. And so that's free. It's for all instruments. It's sponsored by Eastman Saxophones. My Eastman is in the shop, so I'm, I've got my Selmer here, but uh, I'll be bringing the Eastman to that one. And then that evening, I'm playing at Crooner's. Uh, Dunsmore Jazz Room, which is a great, great room in uh, Minneapolis to hear jazz. Got a great uh, band of Minneapolis musicians. So I'm really excited for Minneapolis folks to uh, come see me on uh, Friday, May 31st, 2024. So let's dig into this recording. Um, a great bluesy tune by Wes, but not a blues, not a blues. Blues is a very specific musical form. This isn't close to that. This is an AABA tune. It's got some kind of classic West Montgomery chromaticism in the bridge, some chromatic two fives uh, in there, which add a bunch of nice spice. It's a really memorable tune. It's, it's really built on the minor pentatonic scale for the A section, so that gives it sort of a bluesy sound without being actually a blues. So we've got, uh, we've got Jimmy Smith on the organ. Maybe I've done one other Jimmy Smith listening uh, session. So he's playing the B3, I think it's B3, Hammond organ on this one. And um, there's no bass player on this. So most organ bands don't have a bass. So traditionally, it's left hand on the organ, um, often in tandem with the left foot on bass pedals. And I think Jimmy's technique sort of involved both, um, using, using the left hand for walking the bass or playing the bass line, and then sort of adding a little kick or a little attack to it with, uh, with the pedal. So, I mean, Jimmy was using all four limbs, left hand, right hand, and both feet to play the organ. So that's cool. So the, the, the organ trio, the classic organ trio is organ, guitar, right? And then we have drum set. So Grady Tate on the drums. So that's the classic trio. There's no bass, right? So there's sort of the, the harmony in the main line, in this instance, uh, guitar, uh, organ, also providing harmony in the bass line and drums. And now very often in an organ group is percussion, congas. So we have Ray Beretta on percussion or, you know, specifically congas. So listen in to what's going on there. You may, you may not even notice. So, you know, just kind of pay attention. See if you can find those four voices when we get started and uh, we'll go from there. Here we go. Road song. <laughs> Let's settle into the sound of this. Listen to the bass. Alright, so there's the bass part. Of course, we're hearing drums on the cymbals. Bass and drums. find the conga in there. Da, boom, boom, da, boom, boom, da, boom, boom. Two, three, two, four, and two, four, and. That's 
mostly what he's doing. So whenever you tune in to Ray Beretta on the conga, you're gonna find out he's doing that one pattern, the conga beat. That is so swing, jeez. So we hear single line stuff from Wes, right? And the comping is in the organ. So Wes played with his thumb, with his thumb, not with a pick. So he had all this insane technique playing with his thumb. Great repeated notes, swing so hard. Very bluesy. And now this Wes sound of octaves. That kind of fuller, thicker sound, maybe it reminds you of George Benson, Wes Montgomery. And those cool interjections from Jimmy and the comic. Take a take that. And so this is sort of a standard Wes Montgomery thing where he was playing single lines for his first uh, chorus, second chorus, all this uh, octave stuff. It's a way that he used to build, and it was effective every time he did. If he did it a hundred times, it worked a hundred times. different sounds. There's still a bass on the organ, then there's the lines he's playing, then there's the sort of big band shots that he's getting. All these sounds out of the organ. Amazing instrument. And Wes is comping. So listen to how the guitar is comping behind the organ. So, so he's comping in sort of a specific, sort of a clave-like pattern. Um, is it 100% the same thing over and over? No, but it has that feel of being a percussion instrument more than guitar. There's a lot of rhythm going on, right? Listen to Grady Tate's snare drum, Ray Beretta on the conga, the comping. The, the solo aside, right? Like there's so much rhythm interconnected. Fantastic. And then Jimmy on top. <laughs> Ridiculous. I mean, it's so much technique, which is impressive, but it's so swinging. And all that t technique somehow felt like it made sense with this greasy groove as opposed to being, you know, a, a technical show. I did, it didn't feel like that to me, although it was. That's how you do it. And you hear Grady Tate catching the melody? Listen to Grady. And coming up here, this rhythm. Fantastic drumming. He's playing this melody. His comping, he's not just making stuff up on the drums. He is playing this song. How Jimmy answers the melody. There's space in the melody for an answer. Beautiful. A tag ending. actually just tag that ending once. So um, on a gig, um, the, the standard tag ending, which is let's play what's on the sheet, and now let's play the last four measures again, and usually we play it a third time. So what's there and two more times. So they did what's there and one more time. It worked just fine. Um, if I'm on the gig, I hope I would have been paying attention that I found that they were ending after that, after just one tag. Maybe they rehearsed that, I wasn't at the rehearsal, I wasn't paying attention, whatever. If I'm on autopilot, I might have gone on to do it a third time. So um, 
sounds like they rehearsed it. Sounds like they had played this. Grady Tate knew this tune, as did Jimmy. So they had played this, and great. I mean, this is a really complete-sounding performance. So, you know, just things like uh, me being so impressed with Jimmy Smith's double time, but then, uh, you know, it's, it's impressive playing. It really is, like those chops. Holy crap. But, um, but then to take it a level deeper, and lots of times a lot of chops get in the way of the music or they take us out of it. And now I'm thinking about all the practice hours that so-and-so put in as opposed to how hard this band, this unit is playing. And so something about the way Jimmy was playing, um, it was serving the music, not detracting from it. So I guess that's probably subjective or perhaps we can agree I'm right about everything. That would take the subjectiveness out of it. I don't know if we're all going to agree, though. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool. And, um, you know, I'm sure we could play 10 more recordings of Fast Playing, and I'd say, oh, yeah, to me, that's taken me out of the music. It's impressive, but eh, it kind of leaves me cold. And then there's other times. So that is going to be an interesting thing for me to think about, actually. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not necessarily going to transcribe it or anything. It doesn't matter what the notes are. It's something about the intention or how he said it in the time, um, I'm not sure what it is. And that's interesting to me because I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to pull out some chops and have it serve the moment, not get in the way of the moment. So maybe you heard other things like that or as you're listening to music, those little things that you just sort of catch yourself thinking and maybe they're very personal things uh, just like that. I mean, that's, that's not a standard thing to talk about, um, but it's intriguing to me and listening is going to get me there. It's not about practicing. It's about me listening to this recording some more, listening to Jimmy and finding out why I felt like that worked so well. And here's the other thing. You maybe you didn't care. You didn't notice. I've, I've talked about it. I'm, I'm still talking about it and you still don't care. That's great because that's something meaningful to me. So that's going to make me develop like that as a musician. And you're a musician and you, there was something else here you totally dug that I didn't even mention. Great, and you take that. And that's how we can be inspired by the same music and develop in totally different ways, but personal ways. I, you know, difference, interesting, but I love personal. So um, yeah, yeah, so I, there's certainly a lot of personality in there. Then think about the conga, about how Ray Barretta, I don't know if he ever played anything that wasn't to, for, and. Two, that slap, that high slap sound on beat two, and the open four and, usually on a you know lower sounding conga, or the same conga but open versus closed sound. Um, that that didn't vary. He got paid for the gig, I guess, right? But he knew what the gig was. His gig wasn't to be soloing and playing all kinds of other stuff. His gig is hold down the fort. And it's so interesting that in the organ trio or the organ band, the conga was very often the fourth player, not a sax player. Like, where the heck's a sax player, right? I know I'm thinking that too. Uh, no, conga player. Huh, who knew, right? But apparently, apparently, it was important to that sound. And yeah, it really, it's pretty hip to, you know, hear what it sounds like with the conga. So that's a really wonderful addition. So anyway, I went down a couple uh, rabbit holes there as we were uh, talking about things, but my goodness, what a great swinging, gr wonderful record. Um, other parts of the album have some Oliver Nelson arrangements, great jazz arranger. So it's, uh, it's a pretty deep album uh, from 1966. Hope you enjoyed that road song. I hope I'm going to see you in Minneapolis on Friday, May 31st. And uh, absolutely hope I'm going to see you inside Jazzwire and we can work on uh, Road Song together. All right. Take care. Have a great week.